So good morning, bonjour. Thank you to Vania for the uh, introduction and for the uh, opportunity to visit. I did come to Sao Carlos once before, about two and a half years ago, when I first met Vania, and I was visiting Igor Polyakarpov, who I guess is in biology or biotech or something like that. Yeah, um, we had a, a collaboration program. In fact, that was only, um, it's great to be back in Brazil, but I haven't been to Brazil for that many years. I only came for the first time in 2010. I don't know why. Uh, Brazil has always been interesting for me. I like football, so, you know, it was kind of, wow, you know, I should have come here before. But I came for the first time in 2010 for a meeting of uh, the Brazilian chemical industry, and then I thought that was great. So I came back again later that year to Rio to meet with Peter Seidel, some of you may know, in the uh, university in Rio, Federal University in Rio, and when they were starting what they call the Green Chemistry School and the Green Chemistry Network, and I went up, I came back again a few months later and went to visit Fortaleza and uh, to meet Carioca, who I think was at the time running the Brazilian Green Chemistry Network. So I met lots of people and I got to see a few different places in the country. And uh, on this, this week, which is, as you heard, is sponsored by the Royal Society of Chemistry, it gives me a chance to visit some more places. So tomorrow, tonight, I go to Porto Alegre, which is my first time there. And when I go there, I'm going to meet somebody who is a student, because last year, this year, we had some Brazilian students on your SWB, Science Without Borders, program. And they were all fantastic. We had four students, and they all did really well. So um, it'll be nice to see them again. So anyway, so I'm here talking about this, which is um, my particular uh, kind of favorite in green chemistry. You know. Um, probably some of you know a little bit anyway about green chemistry. Green chemistry is a really big area now. So when we started the journal and the network 15 years ago, it was kind of uh, very focused on process chemistry. It was all about how can you do a chemical reaction in a safer, cleaner, more efficient way. And this was uh, driven by legislation and driven by industry who were very concerned about the cost of waste. They were spending more and more money treating waste, disposing of waste. So they wanted to change things. They wanted to make their processes cleaner. Nowadays, as I would explain, it's much more complicated. It covers resources. It covers still the process. It still covers process. It also covers products. It covers life cycle assessment and metrics and all sorts of different things. So I think now there is a home for everybody. Green chemistry really has something, I think, of interest for everybody. So whether you are organic, inorganic, physical, analytical, whatever your background, there's a good chance there is something in green chemistry that will interest you. So I do encourage you to look and think, where can you use your skills and knowledge in green chemistry? Uh, it's not like you have to give up your day job. We don't say to you, you have to stop being an organic chemist. That's not allowed anymore. People continue to be what they are, but they just practice within the context of green chemistry. So that's a little bit of a recruitment drive, I suppose, to get more people thinking about green chemistry. And uh, the other big uh, advantage, and Vanya knows about this, the other big advantage, I think, is that it allows us to, um, to uh, develop new educational material. Green chemistry is a very powerful educational resource. It's very good at allowing us to talk to a wide range of people about you know, why green chemistry, why chemistry is so important. Um, and this is the reason. The reason is that um, you can start by saying that, you know, chemistry and chemicals are really important because we have this incredible number of different types of uh, articles. So this is a, I like this slide because I like to show it to people. So I, I give talks to lots of different people. I talk to people who are cosmetics people. I talk to pharmaceutical people. I talk to food people and transport people and personal care products people, electronic people, lots of different people. And of course, the nice thing is that every one of those groups of people, they make things or they use things. They need things which require chemicals. So everything we have here needs chemicals. And OK, some of these are changing. So that's an old fashioned camera which is not so common these days. Nowadays, people take photographs using a computer. But, you know, chemicals are as important in a computer as they were in photography. 
uh, inside this computer, you have lots of very interesting chemicals. And those chemicals are very important. They provide a role. They allow the whole computer to function. But they also represent a challenge because, you know, some of the chemicals in that computer, some of the metals in that computer, maybe they are not so widely available. Maybe in a few years' time, there'll be a worry, a concern about whether those metals will still be available. Maybe also there's a worry because when I finish with this computer, um, it's possible the computer will end up in a landfill site. Most of our waste goes into a big hole in the ground. And in that hole in the ground, what will happen to it? You know, eventually it will start to decompose, to break down. Then metals and organic compounds and things like that, they start to leach into the environment, causing all sorts of problems. And everywhere you look, all of these different articles, they all present some really interesting challenges. So, for example, an airplane. So later, uh, my carbon footprint this week is going to be really high, you know, because I'm coming to Brazil, flying around Brazil, and then flying back to the UK on Saturday night. So that's not very good. But the aircraft I'm flying in is a really interesting example of chemistry. It's advanced materials. So the modern aircraft is made of plastic with a metal and aluminium framework, very lightweight, which means the fuel efficiency is really, really good. And if you look at the, uh, the detail, if you look at the, the aluminium frame and how it binds to the plastic that you, you can see around the aircraft, there is a, a good example of adhesion. Adhesion is a very important part of chemistry. How does metal stick to organic polymer? That's not so easy. And there's a lot of research has been done over the years to try to improve that. And what they currently use is, is they have to treat, or what they call prime, the aluminium surface, the metal surface, with chromate. Uh, we don't exactly know what it does, but it probably changes the chemistry on the surface of the aluminium. It allows it to bind strongly to the plastic. Now, chromate is a carcinogen. It's carcinogenic. So chromate, it's not a good idea to use chromate. So in fact, in many places around the world, we are not allowed to use chromate. In the European Union, new legislation is saying no more chromate. So this is going to be a really interesting problem for the aerospace industry. How will they do? So at the moment, they're allowed to continue to use it because there is no acceptable alternative. So when you are flying at 12,000 meters or something in the air, you know, your first concern is safety. You are not thinking about the chromate. You are thinking about making sure the aircraft stays up in the air. So, you know, you don't want the wing to drop off. That's not such a good idea. So, you know, so it's interesting. This becomes a kind of risk-benefit analysis. Like with pharmaceuticals, you know, another area where there's a lot of chemistry. You know, most pharmaceuticals are chemicals. The chemicals have been made by very complicated processes. And those complicated processes will use things like chromates for oxidation. And they will use many other chemicals that nowadays we say are not green. They are hazardous. They should not be used. They cause problems to the worker. They cause problems in the environment. And the manufacture of a pharmaceutical is really, really inefficient. You know, the average resource efficiency of making a pharmaceutical is only about 1%. 1%. 99% of the resource that goes into a pharmaceutical manufacturing process ends up as waste. That's not so good. But we want pharmaceuticals, you know? We want them to cure our illness, to give us a good well-being. And so, therefore, again, risk-benefit. We accept the risk of all the waste, of all the hazardous chemicals, because the benefit we perceive as being very high. Interesting. And then you get into all sorts of interesting social discussions about, so, you know, the plastic bag. I don't know what the policy in Brazil is, but you know the plastic bag in the last five years has become one of the most unpopular things on the planet. It's amazing. The plastic bag, which actually, again, is a really good example of chemistry. You think about the plastic bag that you get at checkout in a supermarket. It's really thin, but it's really strong. Not so many years ago, the plastic bag was not strong. And you'd be carrying it, and oh, no, it's broken again. You know, it's like every car park, every supermarket in the world, you'd see people down on the ground picking things up, you know. Well, actually, now that doesn't happen because of very good catalysis that actually allows us to make really, really strong polymers at really low cost. You know, the amount of resource we use to make a plastic bag is so small. The chemistry that's used to make the bag is a very, very efficient. So it's not a resource problem. It's not a production problem. 
It's actually an end of life problem. The big problem with a plastic bag is what we do with it when we finish with it. So you know the average lifetime of a plastic bag, useful lifetime, is 30 minutes. That's the average amount of time a person uses a plastic bag for. After that, gone. Escaped in the environment. And you know, we only recycle 1% of all the plastics in the world. So most plastic bags end up going into the environment. They, a lot of them end up in the sea in the Pacific Ocean because of the way the ocean currents work. And you end up with an enormous pollution problem because we, as ordinary people, are not to be trusted. We are not good at the way we manage the resource. So every one of these presents an interesting risk-benefit analysis. It presents interesting challenges. From a kind of a life cycle point of view, you can see in all these different places where there are challenges, resource challenges, manufacturing challenges, and product use challenges. And in this area, you have things, this is legislation, whoops, this is uh, new European legislation, which is uh, called REACH, which is re um, registration. So every chemical that we use in Europe now, you have to register the chemical. It then has to be evaluated they measure persistence, bioaccumulation, toxicity, and ecotoxicity. And if it shows a bad set of scores on those assessments, then it will be subject to what they call authorization. The CH is just chemicals. Authorization is basically saying stop using it. So there may be some very, very special occasions, like chromate for the aircraft, when they might say, OK, but you can only use it under really, really strongly controlled conditions. Very, very difficult. So that's very important. But all the way across the life cycle now, we have all sorts of challenges which are saying to us, we have to think about better resources. We have to think about cleaner, greener manufacturing. We have to think about safer products which are not going to cause us and the environment harm. So these are the kinds of challenges we face. And what I wanted to talk about all of those are big stories. Every one of the articles I showed you before is a story. But what I wanted to focus on today, because this is Brazil, is resources. And in particular to say, you know, we do have this big, big challenge in the future because what we have always used to make all of those articles I showed you before, those, the traditional resources, mostly they are not renewable. And nowadays we understand that actually if you don't use a renewable resource, eventually you will have a big problem. It is not sustainable. And the place people always start with is carbon. And they say, okay, the challenge with carbon is simple. Simple. We just have to replace petroleum as a feedstock for making chemicals and replace it with something else. Now, I was in South Africa a few weeks ago, and some of you may know that many years, not many years, a few years ago, uh, South Africa, because it had the apartheid government, they were subject to international boycotts, and basically there was no oil going into South Africa. South Africa had to uh, improvise, and they found a very effective, well, they found, they developed very effective methods of making chemicals from coal. Famous company called Sasol, and they still do that to some extent now. So in a way, they kind of tried to solve the problem, but actually they really, they made the problem worse. Because, of course, coal is also fossil, it's non-renewable in a reasonable time scale. And actually, the environmental footprint of using coal to make chemicals is much higher than using petroleum. The reality is that we need to find a replacement for petroleum which is renewable, genuinely sustainable. In other words, will last forever, is consistent with our environment, and is also providing a low environmental impact. And we need to do that. We have to replace this amazing industry, which has been here for 70, 80 years, very efficient, very organized, very profitable. We have to replace it with something which is renewable. That's the big challenge, and that's what I'm going to spend most of my talk talking about today. But before I do that, I also wanted to make you aware of some of the other big resource challenges we now face. And that is really the periodic table. So here we have some the latest data we were able to get from the National Geological Survey in the United States. And what it does is it identifies these elements in red as the ones that we now believe have less than 50 years of lifetime available based on known reserves and the current rate of consumption. Simple calculation to do. Uh, it's already out of date. It's changing all the time because the rates of use 
of different metals are changing all the time. For example, lithium here is yellow. According to yellow says more than 100 years, no problem. But actually, probably now, it may be more orange because we are using lithium at a really increased rate because of battery technology.